Hello, fans, and welcome back to another special edition of The Crossover with Joe R. Lucas. As most of you know, if you follow The Crossover, listen to me, to commentate my games. I love a good big man. I love the ball and the paint all day long, watch those big boys battle. But I also know that even though it's not like the old days, the bigs are now stretching the floor. And those big men don't exist as much as we did in earlier stages. But in this episode, I decided to bring one of the little guys around. I decided to bring a little guy to talk to me about his journey all the way to Zen at St. Petersburg, where he's currently playing at this time. Please welcome to the crossover point guard and Canadian native, Kevin Pangos or Pangos or P it doesn't matter. Either way, we just either talked way. about it, right? How you doing, yeah, my man? Either way. Good. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Good. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for taking the time out. It, so it is Pangos then, right? It, it's it, Pangos is our American way of saying it. Yeah, that's what I always went by growing up was Pangos, Pangos. But um, like I told you before, my grandparents, whenever they would say my, my little Pangos, they'd call me. So that's my just little. the, <laughs> I guess that that's the uh, European accent when you when you say it like that. So I go with both ways. There you go. I, I hope you didn't take the little man thing wrong, you know, because I always. I always love the big the, the big men. I always talk about the big men, but I know that the game would be really ugly if we didn't have you guys running around there, you know, the, the, distributing the ball and dribbling for us. And it's, that's been my uh, my story my whole life. I've kind of been undersized, so um, you know it is what it is, and I just try to use it to my advantage. You know, get low when I can and and play at my level. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's the truth. I'm, I'm one of the smaller guys, definitely. The 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 proper question to start with is how everybody's good with all these crazy times with COVID and everything. You, your family, and everybody's safe, happy, healthy. Yeah, everyone's doing great. Um, family's healthy back home, and um, you know it's unfortunate they can't see us and travel and do that, all that at this time, especially right. with my my daughter being she's about sixteen months now. Um, but finally, my family's over here, so uh, my wife and my daughter have come over here, and so um, been able to get into Russia. So that's been great, and. Yeah, can't complain. Everything, regarding the circumstances, are really, really going well. Good, that's good. What, what, what's the situation there in St. Petersburg now? Is it, is it things open? Things closed? What's the? No, things, things are pretty open actually. Yeah, um, you know, like here in Madrid, the same thing. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay, so, so yeah. here in St. Petersburg, things, things are open. Restaurants and everything. Obviously, you need a mask in grocery stores, and you keep the right. distance when you can. But, um, no, they're functioning pretty well out here in the city so um you know we try to be careful obviously because you don't want to get it especially during the season and so um we take the precautions but no the city's city's up and running you guys you guys gave and before we get into you a little bit you guys gave the year league a bit a little bit of a scare in the beginning of the season and you guys right now are looking good you guys got a game to make up still against battle but i spoke with casey with casey rivers because you guys had that trip to spain you were coming and it got canceled. You didn't have enough players. You supposedly lost both games, and and that was just a crazy time. And it, he he explained to me, and I don't know if, if this was what he told me at the time, or this is what happened, that you guys were kind of kicked out of your normal um, practice arena to go somewhere else and practice for like three four days, and that's how a bunch of you guys caught the 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 virus. Yeah, so we so we we gym hop a lot out here, um, depending on what gyms are open and not. So, so we played Barcelona in this one, I guess, hockey arena type thing, um, and so that game we played, and a couple guys before it tested positive, and the next day um, we got the test from the day before, and literally almost everyone was positive. And so, um, where did everyone get it? We have no idea, but it got passed around, and and everyone got it all at once, except for maybe two guys. Um, I think Casey said he didn't get it. He didn't, and Alex Poitras. I think those yeah. were the only two that didn't get it. And some of the other guys that had antibodies that had it, I guess, earlier in the summer or something. Right. So everyone everyone had it at once, which was awful for us. And, and your league had to try and figure out how to make that work with the games and stuff. Um, but now you look back and everyone's got the antibodies. So for us, right. it's actually been kind of nice because um, we haven't had, you know, random guys dropping and not being able to play in, in these games lately. So exactly. um, it's, it's been tough to try and catch up the games and they squeeze them in and we haven't had much rest, but what else can you do, you know, in this I'm, type of season? Yeah, I think the year league did it. I mean, to, to be able to change on the move like that, uh, the, the, to say, okay, well, this is what's going to happen. This is what we see happening for this to be a fair league for everybody. We have to figure out a way to make up these games. And I know it's a, it's an extra burden because of the travel logistics and making up games, but 
they did the right thing by far by, by making sure that everybody plays the same amount of games under the same circumstances, even though the circumstances aren't always the same. But the, the, the fact that the league now, look at it the way it is now, it's amazing and it's becoming a great season. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievably competitive. And I think you're right. I think I'm, at first we were, we were really frustrated because we didn't get the chance to play those games. They were going to be four for right. And obviously everyone was, was upset because as an athlete and a competitor, you want to be out there and actually just play the game and get the right result. And, and especially at the end of the season, you don't want teams to be up or down depending on forfeited games. You know, then mm -hmm. you're not getting a true season um, no matter who you are. And so, um, yeah, I think they did the right thing. And now look at the season right now. The teams are, are super so it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I don't think I've seen it like this in a long time. So Yeah, well, I'm going to get into that at the end of this because it's, it's, it's so interesting to see where you guys stand and, and everything else. But this is more about you then. I'm from, I'm from right across the, the lake as, as you are. You, you're born and raised in Toronto and Canada. I was from Rochester, New York. So we, we, we pretty much live the same, the same type of weather. I went to Niagara University. Um, and I played it with a lot of Canadian guys, yeah. but it's a, it's, that's a, it's a hockey country. It's got nothing to do with basketball. There's, I mean, most of the guys that played were just, they were, they were decent players, but they were never, they didn't have any competition around to play against. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, that's changing now, but right. up, it's definitely a hockey country and still is to, to this day. Um, you know, growing up, I, I was a hockey player. I played for six or seven years myself. Uh, my mm -hmm. uncle had a stint in the NHL and my cousin played at Penn State hockey. So it was in my family as well. Um, but nowadays you look and you look at all the NBA players going from Canada. You look at internationally. Um, yeah. Canada is a place where, where basketball is really popular, especially Toronto, that Toronto area, um, greater Toronto area. Basketball has become a culture. And, and you could say a lot of reasons for that. You know, the, the Raptors being one. Um, right. They were founded when this generation was very young and, um, having an NBA team to look at and kind of set your goals on that was huge. Um, guys like Steve Nash, obviously, being the two-time MVP, you know, guys look at that and say, wow, he's come from Canada. You know, it is possible. And you know, you, you, know that, combination. you know that for us, for us Americans back then, Steve Nash was American. We, didn't, we couldn't believe he was from Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Know, no, we, no one it was, really thought of it that way, did they? No, it's like I always, I always compared to like the Beatles and all that. They were like, they're, they're from England. They're, we thought the Beatles were from America. <laughs> you know how Americans think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, did you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But us Canadians, we knew. <laughs> yeah, of course you did. You better know. You, did you ever try your hand at curling? I've tried once or twice. Have you ever done any curling? No, I actually haven't. But it's popular in Canada too. So it's I've never huge. Had a shot, yeah. I remember me and a couple of buddies of mine in college, we went, we went up to, in, in, we were in Welland, Ontario, which is kind of in between, I guess, Toronto and, and Niagara yep. Falls. Yeah, I have family out there. Yeah. yeah. And we went to some, some rink and we started playing, just like messing around with the curl. It was a lot of fun. It's interesting. But I don't know yeah, how yeah, they no, do it. One, one day I got I to gotta give it a shot soon. Yeah, you have to, man. It's a lot of fun. You, your, your dad coached basketball and your mom also played, right? So, I mean, it's essentially, it's in your blood. Yeah. Yeah. My dad coached for 20 some odd years, um, women's basketball in Toronto, uh, university in Toronto. And then my mom played in college and my dad played in, in college as well, or university as we call it in Canada. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, for me, it was, it was easy. I played a lot of sports growing up, but um, basketball was one I was always around. I was always in the gym and I just loved it. You know, I, I became obsessed with it. I, I go back to Steve Nash. I talked to my last interview was with um, Igor Kokoskov, the, the coach of Fenerbahce. And he coached, um, he coached Steve in, in Phoenix. And he told me how he just spoiled him. He, he's, he's, like, he's like, I can't, he's like, I, I'll never want to coach another player again because everything you do is perfect. You know, you, the, your work ethic, your, your dedication to get better on a daily basis. Even when he was an MVP, he said he just had a, a desire to be better on a daily basis. And I read one thing about you that you, you were so in love with him that, you read somewhere where he made 500 shots, so you had to go out and do the same thing. You had to go make 500 that same day. Yeah, I still don't know if it's true to this day that he shot 500 shots or made 500 shots a day. But <laughs> as, a, as a kid, you hear these stories, and and I really wanted to to make it. I wanted to be the best I could be growing up. I took it seriously as a kid, and and knew I wanted to play professional. And so I took it literally. I said, "Oh, well, if he made 500 shots a day, then clearly I have to do the same." So. Um, 
was it 500 every single day to be realistic? No, but there were a lot of days where I'd make 500 shots. And so um, that's kind of how I started with my training when I was a kid. And obviously you adapt and learn and try to work on individual skills and this and that. So, uh, but yeah, I heard that story about Nash somewhere. I couldn't remember right. where, but um, I took it literally. So I, I I was watching a game when I was young and I was a big Sixers fan. I love Dr. J was my idol, Julius Irvin. And and I saw him walk off the court one day, and and it's because it's amazing how we like to emulate people that that play the game, you know. And I saw him walk off the court and take something out of his mouth, and I was like, "What the hell's that?" What? And I, and I said, "He took something out of his mouth." And I like, it's a mouthpiece. It's like what you know some players wear. I'm like, "Well, I want one of those." So I went, made my dad buy one. I went, I went, I practiced the next day with it. I put, I couldn't breathe to save my life. All my gums were all cut up. And my coach is like, what's the matter with you? I'm like, he's like, what's in your mouth? I'm like, it's a mouthpiece. He's like, you're supposed to melt it and like form it to your teeth. I, 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 just, <laughs> I cut the thing off, stuck it in. And it was like rock hard. You know, it wasn't for them. I was like, yeah, it's, yeah, it was. it's amazing that when we see or hear things, we just want to be like them. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and now being, being a pro, you, you remember those days and you say, okay, I'm, lead, I'm an example for kids. You know, you never know right. who's going to, you're going to have an impact on when you're looking at that. Cause I definitely remember those days with watching the Raptors, watching Nash. I remember crossing paths with Chris Bosch one time. Like, just you remember those moments because they mean right. so much to you at that time. Hey, you, just, you just look up to these people sometimes. And now it's it's strange. You know, I mean, I'm 55, and every time I walk around, sometimes I walk around, someone like, oh, man, you, you were my idol when I, was, when I was growing up. And I'm just like, why would I be your idol? <laughs> like, uh, try, to find, <laughs> try to find different idols in life, will you? But it, it, it's it's interesting. I <laughs> have, have looked at you at one point or another and, and thought that way. But it you went. I mean, you obviously had a good high school career. Again, I, I want to go back to the fact that the competition in Canada isn't what it is in the states. And how does a guy from a, a Canadian high school get looked at by teams like Michigan, Temple, UNLV? some really big division one teams. I mean, what, what kind of numbers were you putting up in, in high school and how did you get that type of recognition? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Honestly, I don't even know my numbers because at my school, we didn't really keep stats like that. So I couldn't even tell you what my, my stats were like. Um, the competition, a lot of guys were going prep school at the time. So there were a lot of Canadians that, that played basketball at high level during my time in high school. But mm -hmm. A lot of them weren't in Canada at that moment. Um, the big one that came back at that time was Andrew Wiggins. So we had some, some good battles with him. Um, but to be honest, most of my, my offers and looks from, from us colleges came from my national team experiences. Um, okay. in, the, in the summertime, I played a lot of the under 15, under 17, under whatever, um, national team stuff. And so I remember we were in Hamburg, Germany for world championships and it was under 16 or 17 at that point. And all the college coaches were there. I remember, you know, Bruce Pearl, Coach K, Coach Calipari, like every everyone was there. Um, and so that's where I got a lot of my my looks. And then from there, it was kind of word of mouth. You know, I I played for this coach or played against that coach. And then they, the coaching community, they all talk. And so that's where I got my looks. I played one AU tournament. Um, didn't play very well, to be honest. And so <laughs> I was going to ask you about I, AAU also. Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't really play AAU. And so my my path was kind of different than a lot of people. I played high school, but I don't think coaches really saw me much there. And it was a lot of national team opportunities that, that I got my exposure. AAUs were, I mean, that's, I mean, that at about the time that you were playing is when it was becoming the, the biggest pathway to college. It was, high school, most coaches weren't even recruiting from high schools anymore. They were recruiting through AAU. Exactly. And there were rules actually that of what, high school games they could attend because during the high school mm -hmm. season there were windows the NCAA has all these rules and right. coaches couldn't actually come to games so AU was huge and definitely is huge now um, and it's where a lot of coaches are seeing it but I, I kind of got lucky that way um, with not having to play much AU because again for me it was also my family kind of built me on developing you know my skills and and in the AU circuit there's a game after game after game yeah. and at a certain point that's good to get exposure but where do you work on your game? Where do you practice and get, and get skills and all that kind of stuff? So um, I kind of tried to, tried to balance the, the practice and game aspect of my life. And, um, you know, my parents were a huge influence on that and they kind of taught me that way. And so that was kind of my, my path, you know, a lot of guys mm -hmm. are different, but 
that's the way I kind of approached it. I was, I was, when I coached a little bit in the AEU, it, was, it, was, it seemed like all the teams that wanted, had, they had two good players and that was it. Then everybody else had to like work around those two good players. And the only thing that was important was the win. Like you said, there wasn't any player skill developing at all. It was just win yeah. tournament after yeah. tournament as much as you can. And my guys do, my guys do a whole bunch of research on, on you and, and I do my job too. But is it true? There's some things I, I, I see that I'm just like, this can't be true. Did you and Trey Burt have an offer to go to Michigan? And there's like, what, there's like one scholarship up for grabs and it was a first come first serve or is, is that a true story? Yeah. 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 It was, it was something like that. I don't, I don't know the exact details. Obviously I just know my angle of it, but um, you know, coach Beeline at Michigan was an unbelievable coach and I really respected him and like, like Michigan a lot, but, but he wanted to solidify the point guard spot and, and they were recruiting Trey Burke at the same time. And he kind of just, was honest with me. He said, Hey, listen, Kev, like, um, we have this one scholarship, but if you want to lock in a point guard for, for this year, and if you don't accept it at this time, then I can't guarantee the scholarship will be there for you because we're looking at other players too. And I respected that, but right. at that time it was kind of between Michigan and Gonzaga for me. And I loved them both, but obviously Gonzaga to me was a team that I was just kind of itching towards. There's something about it that I loved. Um, and I wasn't ready to make the decision. And so I, I told him at that time, it wasn't, I guess a week or two later, Trey Burke committed and kind of that, that was it. And, and we, we crossed paths about, I don't know, three or four years later and kind of joked about that moment. Cause um, you know, he obviously remembered and he was just like, Hey, it worked out for everyone. You know, I was right. able to go to Gonzaga and I loved it there, had, had my career out there and, and built great relationships. And Trey Burke had the career he had at Michigan, which was unbelievable. And they made a, national championship run so um, at the end of the day it worked out for everyone and we kind of looked back and laughed on that moment that's good that's good that you can sit back and, and laugh at that because some people get upset about those things you know they, they, coaches take it personal sometimes players take it personal too but and sometimes it's motivating for players too when you go up against that Michigan team you know for sure for sure <laughs> you uh the, the Gonzaga thing I didn't see where in my research that you were actually recruited by them we just saw that you went there and that was because of, of Kelly, because of Kelly Olenek, who was playing there. Was, was he in it a bit, was the fact that someone was going to be there that you knew would be a better influence leaving Canada for the first time, going west to out to Gonzaga, having somebody there, does that make it easier to, to make that, that adaption to, to a new society, new game? Yeah, yeah, I'd say a, a little bit, but I, I don't think that was the determining factor for me. Um, the way Gonzaga approached it was um, they heard me through, this is another way, was through um, my national team coach who coached Kelly Olenek as well. Okay. Um, and so he went to the assistant coach, Tommy Lloyd, and said, hey, there's this guy up in Canada I think you'll like. You might want to take a look at him. Um, and I remember the game that, that Tommy Lloyd came to watch me play, and I had a really good game, actually. Um, and a little story to my, my buddy would always say like, Hey, don't you get nervous when these like college coaches come watch right. you play? And, and I was like, you know, the way I look at it is like, what are the chances I'm really going to go to that school? You know, I only get to pick one. So when all these schools come, like, what's the chance I'm going to go there? Well, they, they asked me before that game and I had a great game and sure enough, like I even said, like, where's the chance I go to Gonzaga? Like, well, who, where's <laughs> that, you know? And sure enough, I picked that school eventually down the road, but, um, for me, they they uh, they sold me on it right away. They they talked about their culture, um, mm. just the way they they do things, their success in the the decade before. They actually had a um, a video that they showed me called the Decade of Excellence, and it was from uh, ninety nine to two thousand and nine. Um, so once they were the Cinderella story, all right. the way up until around that present moment, and they put together this video, and they just talked about all the great players that came through there, you know, starting from that Cinderella story run with Santangelo and all them all the way up until mm -hmm. the current, current year. And they put together a piece of the point guards and there was all these point guards, Blake Stepp, Derek Gravio, Matt Santangelo, all, all these guys, um, Dan Dickow. And I just looked at that and I was like, I want to be the next one. You know, I want to be the next point guard to step in there and, and, and play really well under, under this team. And so, it sold me right away when I, when I saw that I, I couldn't turn it down because I wanted that opportunity. And also I got advice from um, when I played the national team, I played with some, some vets that were a lot older than me and, and they kind of gave me advice. They said, listen, one of the things that you should look at looking into a college is go somewhere where they've had someone like you in the past, you know, similar styles mm -hmm. and everything. And that was great advice. And they said, because 
when you get there, they know how to develop you and they, they value what you can bring to the table. You know, if you go to a team that plays in a system or something that, that doesn't suit your style, then when you get there, it's, it's something brand new and they might not know how to work with you and develop you to be your best. And so when I saw all those other guys, you know, par going everything ahead of me, I was like, this, this is somewhere that I can fit right away and somewhere that is perfect for me. They have, you know, the culture is unbelievable, the style of play, and um, I couldn't pass it down. That, that's, a, that's an incredible piece of advice. It's something I've never actually heard before. I mean, it, it, makes, it makes so much sense to, to, to be in a program that's used to seeing someone. I mean, you, let's, let's just be honest here. I'm not trying to be anything like out of politically incorrect or whatever, but you're a prototypical Gonzaga player. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, you're just, yeah. you're, you're, even before you got there, you could have just looked at you and go, that guy, that guy could go to Gonzaga or Utah or, you know, one of those schools, you yeah. know? Yeah, but to yeah, get that yeah, yeah. to get that kind of advice is huge. I've never heard that before, but man, that that had to fit in you up because you could have ended up in Michigan, end up sitting on the bench, and and maybe not having a European career after that. I mean, you know, no one ever knows. You, you never know. You never know when you look back. You know, say like, oh, what if this, what if that? But my time at Gonzaga, I wouldn't trade for the world. You know, and and the thing that I loved was when I looked at their stats, they recruited me with, they showed me everything they were scoring like 80, 90 points a game. And I was like, that's, that's the way I want to play. You know, I want to get up and down. I want to shoot threes. I want to do this and that. So, so when they told me all this, I was like, it's the place I want to be. And sure enough, it was four years, the best four years of um, my life. It was awesome. Dude, dude, you dropped 33 points in your second game as a, as a freshman. What, what, yeah, that, that yeah. was another, that was another thing I read that I had to call my guys on, online here at IMG and go, no, this can't be right. You guys better double check this. You dropped 33 in your second game yeah. as a freshman? Yeah, it was, it was, it, honestly, it was life changing. I'm not even going to lie. Um, so the, the first game I didn't start, I came off the bench. We played at a smaller school. And the second game, uh, Tommy Lloyd, the guy that recruited me, the assistant coach, um, he came up to me and said, Hey, Kev, we're going to, we're going to start you for this game where we played a rival, Washington State. Um, and he's like, they're going to be playing a zone. And he's like, so we're starting you. And he's like, we're starting because you shoot it. So, shoot the ball like you're not in there you're in there to shoot the ball and so I took him literally he said shoot the, ball. So the, the night before actually I was in the gym on the shooting gun and I was shooting I don't know hundreds and hundreds of threes because I knew I was gonna be starting and I was so nervous so nervous <laughs> and so I wanted to make sure I was ready and sure enough um started the game and I think the first six possessions I think I shot four threes out of those first six possessions you know I was letting it fly and I hit a couple and kind of got it in a run. You know, I got in rhythm and everything. And I think I shot 13 threes that game, nine for 13 yeah, um, nine. at 30, 33 points. And um, it was, it was actually life changing. And I say that because I would go to class sometimes. I remember one of my classes, um, we had to introduce ourselves and, and we went around and, and I said, like, yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Kevin Tangos. I'm, I play basketball here. And someone asked me, like, oh, like, are, you, are you a manager? <laughs> and I, said, <laughs> I said, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm on the basketball team. And this, is oh, after the, this is after the 33 this, point this was, this was before. This uh, was just before. before. Okay. Yes, this is before. And so they asked me, and I'm like, no, no, I'm actually playing. You know, I'm on the team, this and that. Well, sure enough, after that 33-point game, that, that never happened to me again, you know, because <laughs> all of a sudden I could tag a basketball culture. Um, people recognize me. So that was kind of cool. Um, but no, overall, it was, it was an unbelievable experience. It was kind of a blur. I think it was one of those games you just get in rhythm and let it fly, and you, you don't even know what's going on. You know, it's just surreal. And so, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a cool experience and definitely a good memory. A couple of questions, and we'll get off of Gonzaga here. We'll move, we'll move on. But the, the, one of the things I'm most interested in is that, and this is a little bit of a selfish question because a lot of people probably didn't follow Gonzaga like I did. But you guys were always that team that was always like seated number one. You, I mean, you're undefeated throughout the season. Everybody knew the Western, the, the conference that you guys played. It wasn't the strongest conference. You guys had good teams like St. Mary's and teams like that to challenge you on a yearly basis. But it was mostly you guys. Mm -hmm. But always at tournament time, it can never be. It was like always like I picked you guys like twice in my in my my bracket, you know. And it was like God, they could just never do it for me. It just drive me crazy. What, what was that like? I mean, because you guys had to know that, that the, the, the perception is what I use the word I'm looking for. The perception was reality sometimes for you guys. Yeah, you know, so I think when I look back at that, Gonzaga was always 
the underdog, you know, starting from right. when they made their Cinderella story run, they were known as the underdog, you know, so they'd come in and they'd play these big schools and they weren't really expected to win, but they'd hold their own or they'd, they'd win for many years. Um, and then kind of the, the years, maybe a bit before I got there, or when I got there, there was kind of a little shift where all of a sudden my sophomore year, we were ranked number one, you know, and Kelly right. was an all American and this and that we were ranked number one in the country and that was foreign territory to Gonzaga. You know, they'd never been ranked number one in the country. And so um, now all of a sudden the, the underdog is now the favorite. And right. so it was just a complete shift. And did we have a good team? We had a great team, you know, a lot of depth, everyone filled the roles perfectly. It was great. We were close, close team. Um, and so we get to March Madness and I think it was a shock to our, our system almost, you know, where now we go into these March Madness games and, teams are expecting us to win and rooting for us to lose, you know? And, and, and so the, fans, the, hun the hunter, the hunter, is, the hunter has now become the hunter. Exactly. There you go. So, so I remember we were ranked number one and we were on the West coast for the second round game against Wichita state. And um, oh, oh, you're yeah. in Salt Lake city, which is so close to Gonzaga and all, our fans are all on the West coast, you know, so we're the home team technically. And we're losing the game and I remember the crowd turning on us and like okay it wasn't just our fans but the the majority the neutral fans were all shifting because everyone wants to see a good upset you know and so so now it's a complete shift and we ended up losing that game we were ranked number one and um it was a, a year that we had a great opportunity to go to the final four and we we couldn't make it so I kind of I kind of think that was the shift and now you look at it and, and I don't even think people consider Gonzaga an underdog anymore you know you, you no, look at them no. this year they're they're talked about as the um, number one favorite by far, maybe them and Baylor. And so things have shifted. People go there not expecting to be an underdog. They go there as, as trying to be one of the powerhouse schools. And um, so, yeah, that was probably the, the shift in times was, was at that point. And unfortunately, we didn't make it as far as um, I wanted to. Elite Eight was my senior year we made it to. Uh, we lost to Duke in the Elite Eight and they ended up winning the national championship. So that was a great run. But I always wanted to make a Final Four and uh, unfortunately couldn't. You know, one of my favorite questions to, to guys like you that, that played four years of college, had a great career, um, and, and that you, you play that last game in the Elite Eight, for example. And, and I always love that, that. My favorite question is, what, what was the feeling afterwards? Well, I mean, you're, you're, like you said, the best four years of your life are, are now behind you from this point on. You, you don't have an automatic NBA you know, you may have a dream of playing the NBA, but it's not automatic for, for you. What's that last game like, uh, knowing that you're not going to put that uniform back on again? Yeah, it was crazy. I, I don't cry very often, but I'm pretty sure I cried after that game. Um, especially just the emotions are all at once. You know, it's your last game. You lost. Obviously, that's mm -hmm. a good one. Um, we wanted to go to the Final Four. That was a mission of ours from day one, and we lost just, just short of that. Um, and then the brotherhoods, when you're in college, you know what it's like. Like you're around these guys. Exactly. It's not just in the gym. Then you go get food after. Then you go, you go everywhere. You go to the mall. You go here. You go there. So um, that culture and that community of your brothers is, is now going to be gone. And so you're just going to be at a new stage. So the unknown um, is kind of kind of freaky and scary. And so I think that combined is just the emotions just kind of hit you at once. And um, you realize like, hey, new chapter in my life is coming up. And you try to take it all in at the moment, what you've been through the four years, and um, you know, go forward. It was great. I I, I um, talked to a lot of kids that, from Europe that want to go over to to play college in the states. They get offers to go play, and and I always I always tentatively say, hey, like you said, and I said already here today, it's the best four years of your life. But while you're doing it, it's not really the best four years of your life because I mean, you're going to school every day, you're practicing three times a day, you're getting yelled at by coaches and you're traveling all over the place. You're trying to make up exams. You have to keep your GPA up so that you can keep playing. These are not the best four years of your life while you're living them. But once you leave, it's like, man, I would, it just, it, number one, it developed me for life. It, it, it made, it made me a stronger person mentally physically emotionally but also it was like I just missed it so much afterwards I was like why did I miss it I hated it when I was there that's that's hilarious you say that because that's exactly my take on college too when I talk to people about it I go you know you look back well during 
you're up at anywhere from 6, 7 a.m. Exactly. And you're busy the entire day. You have weights, then you have class, another class, then you have practice, then you have study hall, then you have if you want to go shoot after or whatever, or extra tutor time with the work. Ridiculous. So you're, you're sleep deprived like crazy. Um, but when you look back, like the growth that you get from college and how much you grow as a person, the people you get to meet and the memories you have is, um, is priceless. And so I tell everyone that, that I talk to over here, cause I've talked to a lot of young guys too. I say, go to college if you can, you know, right. you figure out yourself, a lot of you develop as a person, but basketball wise, you also get a lot of an opportunity, um, you know, you're one of the guys, so you get opportunity to make those mistakes and play a lot of minutes and develop your, your skills as well. And so um, you'll look back and just like you said, it's the, the best for years of your life and you miss it so much. But during you are in the grind and you're yeah. busy and overwhelmed and exhausted, um, but unbelievable four years and, and you look back and it's always great. Yeah, I always feel like if you could emotionally and physically and mentally get through four years of college and playing basketball at the same time, you pretty much set yourself up for some sort of success along the line, no matter what it, no matter what you do, everything else is going to be easy from that point on. 100% because you learn how to time management, you learn how to get through when you're not feeling it to still be able to accomplish things and get things done and check it off the list. And I remember after the season when, when we didn't have training or study hall or anything, or sorry, like weights and all this kind of stuff, um, you'd look and be like, what do I do with my time? <laughs> you know, what, what do I do now? Like I have six or seven extra hours a day. Like, like how do you, I should be getting A's. I could do like 10 majors at this. Like you have so much time. So, uh, that, 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 that's dangerous for a lot of players though, Kevin. It, it can, it can be, that is true. It can be. So if that's you're a, smart, it, yeah, it's that, that for sure. That, that's a double-edged sword right there for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, did you have a, did you have a Slovenian passport before, you finished at Gonzaga, like before you came to Europe, you probably will talk about your first trip to, to Grand Canarias, but did you have that passport in hand when you came here? Did you come over as an American player? So interesting story with that, actually. I think it was um, when I was doing the national team stuff in high school, um, my dad actually talked to, I'm pretty sure it was Maurizio um, Giardini with Fenerbahce. Uh -huh. um, he was with the Raptors at that time and stuff, working with Team Canada and doing all this stuff. And, um, I guess they got talking about citizenship stuff and, and my grandparents are Slovenian. And so right. um, we were talking to my dad and, and Mauricio said something like, Hey, listen, if, if Kevin ever ends up going overseas um, and playing basketball and wants to play professionally, um, having dual citizenship is very beneficial in certain countries, you know? Right. Um, and ex right. yeah. And explained it to my dad and how it worked and this and that. And so right away, my dad uh, looked into it and got on, on top of that stuff. Cause he actually didn't have his passport and they can't skip a generation. And so um, it ended up first, he needed to get his applications done and get his Slovenian citizenship. Um, so then me and my sister could, could get ours um, after that. Okay. And so it took, I don't know, years to do. Um, right. Cause he had to do all the work and go here and travel there and get stamps and stuff. But um, he got it done. And then sure enough, had it ready for my first pro year for, with Grand Canaria, which, which actually helped me because, I didn't realize that I needed the legit passport. You know, I thought something saying like, oh yeah, he's a Slovenian, whatever, was right, good right, enough. Like a birth, like a, a, a birth certificate type of yeah, thing. Yeah, like saying I'm approved yeah. of something, right? right? So I sure enough, my agent, like, he's like, hey, can you send me a picture of your passport? And I was like, well, I don't actually have the passport, but I have this like piece of paper that says I'm good or something, right? <laughs> he's like, no, no, Kev, you don't realize like, you don't have the passport, you don't have the job, you know, because it was Spain and you need the right. citizenship for that. And so I had to fly cross country to go to this embassy to get something stamped and this picture is done. Um, and sure enough, I got in time to end up getting the job, but um, I was oblivious. I didn't know how it worked and thought that this piece of paper was going to be good enough, but it wasn't. And I almost paid the price. <laughs> what, what, what did you know about Las Palmas before you, before you went out there? Nothing. Nothing, I didn't right? know. I didn't know. I didn't know anything really. I, uh, when you hear Canary Islands, the islands, that sounds great. You know, whatever. Yeah, whatever right, you, when you're from upstate New York, like I was, or from Canada, anything that said it had a beach to it, a tattoo, it was a good thing. Yeah, party. that sounds great to me. And so I did my research a little bit and, um, you know, I think some, some guys that I knew had played there in the past or, um, some people I knew through the system. And so 
did my research and stuff and that was a great opportunity you know playing in the the ACB obviously um your first year that's very lucky and I was fortunate to be able to do that such a competitive league and so yeah sure enough took the job and and um you know my wife now but at the time we were just dating she came out with me and um we loved it great place fans were great um a lot of travel that was a little tricky but you get that, used that, to that, that, that's that's my next question but my two questions you're, you're trying to answer I'm mean, already one was it if you went out alone it's good to go with uh, always good to go with somebody oh, and the nice, other one yeah. is the other one is the travel from there man it's like you spend all of your time in it you spend more time in an airport and an airplane than you do on a court I think and from from there yeah yeah for sure your travel is ridiculous there and sometimes we'd stay on the road in Barcelona Madrid because there's no point in coming all the way back to the islands to go out to your next road game. And so it was a little tricky, but I think I got the system down a little bit because every, every morning there's a flight from the Canary Islands or from Las Palmas um, to Barcelona, Madrid at like 7 a.m. So we'd wake up at like 4 or 4.30 or something to get to the gym. And mm. so, yeah, that sucked. You get to the gym, whatever, but that, it's a three-hour flight to the mainland, and I'd sleep that three hours every time. And so that kind of saved me where, um, you know, I caught up on sleep during that. and the, flight went like this you know before I knew we were landing and kind of made the trip easier see that's another advantage of being a little guy man it's easier to sleep on those <laughs> flights you know those big guys don't have, that, don't have all I, that room I, I can stretch out my legs no problem on normal economy class seats and I right. just lean back and I'm, I'm knocked out no problem it's easy God, I, used to, I used to hate people like you my, my, my wife is the <laughs> same way we get on a plane and we fly somewhere and I'm just it's like I just I'm like I might as well just have flown alone I mean dude before the <laughs> yeah. flight even takes off, she's already asleep. Yeah, right. that would have been me too. But it's a great opportunity for you because not only is it your first experience in the Europe, but you're also playing in Euro Cup, which is which is the second best league in all of Europe right now. I mean, you come over here, you experience the ACB, which is a, a good league to play in, a really good league to start in, and and on top of it, you're playing Euro Cup. What the step up in competition? What was it like for you? Was it was it demanding? Was it your first professional? Because you, you have so much pressure on yourself, too. To, you're in this new country. you got to do well. You know, you can't, you can't screw up here your first year, especially being thrown right into the Euro Cup. Yeah, yeah for sure. It was um, – I was very fortunate to play at that level right away in, uh, you know, Euro Cup and, and in ACB. The combination was great. And I didn't realize at the time how important that was and, and the level that I was playing at. Um, and I guess you can say ignorance is bliss, you know, sometimes exactly. I was just going out there. I had, I had no idea. Like, okay, I'm getting paid to play basketball. This is amazing. You know? So I'm just out there kind of um, ignorant to it all. And so I definitely had my ups and downs, you know, I had some really good games. I had some really poor games and everything. Um, but it was a great opportunity for me because I was playing good minutes, you know, me and um, Albert Oliver, actually, who's mm -hmm. um, the ultimate vet in Spain. Um, yeah. he's, he's the other point guard with me. He split minutes. And for me, it was great playing behind him as well because he had so much experience. And so for all the mistakes that I made, he was just the steady guy all the time, you know, and he'd always take me aside and, you know, help me out with some of the tactical and, and um, you know, just help me adapt to, to the European game. And so I, I think I had the ultimate situation um, my, my first year. I got very lucky with that. Um, and it just helped me build, you know, myself and, and uh, develop my game a lot that first year and, and you know, gain momentum overseas. You, you made all, all Euro Cup second team that in your first season, which is a pretty good, pretty good thing. You had a two-year deal with, with Herbalife, but you took off. You, you took the step up. You, were, you left and went to Lithuania. You had a great situation. You had a good point guard to play with, to split times. Why is, is, is it just something you can't say no to? Because now, because you were like me, I think. You, you came over here and you were just playing games and you had no idea that you had a different record in the Euro League and the Euro Cup and, and another record in Spain. And then all of a sudden, on top of it, they throw a King's Cup at you and you're like, what the hell is all of this? <laughs> what is that? I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, we had, we had no idea when we come over here and, and you never been. And it's, it's kind of embarrassing now to, to say that, but it's the truth. I mean, we don't know what the Euro League was or we didn't know what the Euro Cup was when we came over here. And they were just sending me like, oh, well, you know, you know we got to jump on a plane and go to another. We have to take our passport on this trip. Oh, okay, no big deal. We were just playing another game, you know, but, yeah. but you took that step up immediately. And second year in and you go to Lithuania. And was it just that I can't say no deal or, or what was it? 
Um, I think it was just an opportunity to, to move up. You know, I, I really don't mind change. I actually like change a lot. I like um, new opportunities, new challenges and that kind of stuff. And so any chance I get to, to move up, I guess you could say to, to Euro league in that, that situation where I was going from Euro cup to Euro league, um, I couldn't say no. I thought it was a great opportunity for me. I thought it's another chance for me to um, expand my game and um, just take my game to a new level. And so um, the, the opportunity in Grand Canary was great, but it just wasn't the same. It was, it was something that in, in Zalgiris in Lithuania was going to be a new coach. Um, I could learn something else from. It was going to be a new competition, which I now knew and understood, you know, the way you're. Right. you're um, and so I thought it was going to be great for me to just continue growing and, and developing my game. Did you get to watch a lot of yearly games when you were playing? And I mean, again, we didn't, you didn't know what was going on, but did you happen to watch any or no? I did a couple, but I wouldn't say I followed it a lot. Um, again, cause I didn't, didn't really understand it fully. So, um, you know, I'd obviously being in the ACB, I knew, okay, these, you know, Bar Barcelona, Madrid, Basconia, um, I think at that time, maybe even Malaga, one other team was, was in the year league or right. three or four teams, whatever. So, I knew they were in that league and I, I followed it a little bit, but I didn't follow it religiously. I didn't know the groups at that point and who was in first, who was in second and all this kind of stuff. So, um, so no, I, I didn't really follow it fully until um, my second year when I was in Zagreb. And then obviously I, I dove right into it and um, was immersed in it. So um, the first year, again, I was, I was completely ignorant. And as, as the year went along, I learned more and more and followed it more and more, but right. Um, not as much, obviously, as now and, and the years um, after that. What, what's your first reaction in Kaunas when you when you arrived at Kaunas? I mean, now it's like it's like you, you went back to the snow again. You went back to the cold. <laughs> yeah, my first reaction was, "Why did I do this?" <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. For me, for me, it's fine because obviously being from Canada, Spokane in college was in the snow, so like right. the cold weather. Uh, it was nothing new. Uh, I just got spoiled that first year in, in Grand Canary because it was warm all the time. But it's hard um, to go back, man. It's hard to go back to that stuff. It is, and that's I think what was hard is like I actually I thought I was on a vacation my whole first year because I'd never lived in a a climate like that for a long period of time. Um, so it was brand new to me. So now going to Countess was kind of just immersed myself back in the same. And um, I'd actually been to Lithuania. Um, when I was a kid with the national team, um, there was a tournament in Lithuania, a, a, a exhibition tournament or something in Lithuania. So I'd been there before. So actually some of the sites I kind of vividly, you know, knew a little bit. Um, but then going there, obviously seeing the arena they had was unbelievable. Uh, seeing the fans that they get to games was incredible. And, and it's just basketball is a religion out there. It's unbelievable. And so obviously smaller town, you know, um, really relaxing way of life simple lifestyle um but the basketball there was um incredible and it's something that um everyone should see in europe because it's um it's in impressive it's like a the, the place is like a mecca it's just it, it's it's where people go to worship you know what i mean it's it, it's that that's yeah. what it is it's to watch a game in that stadium is is probably one of the best experiences i've ever had i've gotten to play in it before and and it's just it's just such a beautiful place. But what I love most about that organization is how well it's run. Everything you go there and everything's just like perfect. The offices, the, the everything's clean. It just it just looks so it, it it looks like it's theirs. You go to other teams and other places and it looks like it's shared by everybody. And this is like this is just yeah. it's all how geared is, man. It's all them and they're all just one big happy family. Yeah, no, that's definitely it. When you get there, they they treat everyone right. They treat the the players, their families, everyone. There's even like play places for people that have kids and stuff. And there's, um, you know, the locker room's nice. And when I was there, uh, I was in the locker room more than my own house, you know, because <laughs> why would I leave? It was so nice. You know, I'd be stretching there, watching TV, doing whatever I need to do. And so um, you're right, though. They, they really make that area, that arena uh, feel like home for everyone. And it's welcoming and um, they got a really, really good situation over there and they've, they've done it right. I, I remember at the time talking to some of the, the GMs or the staff and they would say they'd go to the U S and go all over the world to study other arenas, right. um, you know, to see how they function, how they make the most out of, you know, the, the time and uh, to make sure they're getting the most revenue and making sure it's, 
cleanness, like everything. And, and you can tell they've done that because it's clicking on all cylinders and they, they use that for everything and made it, made it really, you know, ideal. They're, they're a, they're a club that, as, as you know now, because now you have the experience and you've been here long enough, you know that they're, they're a club that you know, over the last couple of decades has always been a tough out, tough team to beat, especially if you play them there. Um, they, they weren't expected, they're never expected to do, they don't have the expectations, let's say, of Real Madrid or Fenerbahce on a, on a yearly basis. Your first season, you guys end up 14 and 16, a couple, couple spots out of the playoff. But, but the next season was, was the big one. And, and you went from 8.7 points a game the first season there. Then you became the team leader. You scored, you were scoring like 12 and a half points a game, 12.7 points a game. And, and you just kind of took over and, and, and became that team leader. What was it something that Saras did with you? Was it, was it just the fact that you were comfortable with your second year with the same team? What makes you, what gives you that confidence to go out and start to play the way you did your second season? Yeah, honestly, I I don't know if you can pinpoint one thing. I think it's just um, a combination. You know, Saris was – he was really tough on me my first year. He challenged me a lot. Um, and, you know, I grew a lot from that. You know, it wasn't always easy. He'd really, you know, um, go, go at me sometimes. And, and I think it was just because he wanted to challenge me to get better. Um, and so I went into the off season kind of with a new approach. Um, you know, I had a lot to think about for those two or three months off. And um, – you know, mentally, I changed my approach to it. And I, I put in a lot of work to, to get my body right and get my skills right and kind of went in with a, a new perspective and wanted to be kind of the leader, you know, wanted to step in and be like, okay, you know, like I said before, I, I always wanted to continue developing, continue moving up. And in this situation, I didn't switch teams. But I think I came in my second year with a, a new perspective on how I could build my game and help make this team better in that in that moment. And so um I tried to do that. I, I tried to be more vocal. I tried to, you know, be more aggressive on offense and, um, you know, make plays for my teammates and uh, take the responsibility, you know, at the end of games and do this kind of stuff. And um, did it always work out? No. And, and Star still got at me sometimes, but I think he saw that I was really trying, you know, and I was trying to, to do what I could to help the team win and, and, you know, make my mark. And, um, you know, that team, that team was great too, because we had a really close knit group of guys and, um, I think everyone kind of molded together great. The new guys adapted really quick. The guys that were there with me the year before uh, kind of took where they left off and kept building. And um, by the end of the year, we were clicking on all cylinders and uh, you know, really surprising teams. I think it caught people off guard. Cause like you said, Zalgiris isn't really known to be a powerhouse all the time. And um, we were competing at the high level. Yeah, you guys beat Olympiacos in that last game, which was a crazy comeback. You guys were down by 15 or 18 at one point and came back and won that game. There was a whole, it was a crazy thing that happened then because Olympiacos lost like the last three games and, and you guys won a couple. Madrid, Madrid won out because I remember because I was supposed to be commentating the games for Real Madrid here for the playoffs. And all of a sudden, before I knew there's a three way tie, Madrid drops down to fifth place. Olympiacos goes up to third place. And you guys crossed with the Olympiacos. And I said, man, they got their number now. They're going to win this thing. And you go out, you, you, you drop 20 to game one. You drop 21 in game four. The two most important games, the opening game and the closing game. Mm-hmm. And you went off. That, that was just – that was an incredible season that was topped off by going to the Final Four. What, what do you remember most about that moment and then going to, to Belgrade and, and, and being at the Final Four? Yeah, um, I remember. I remember going into that series. Um, we were obviously sixth; they were third, um, but we didn't feel like underdogs at all. You know, I right. think I think we we knew that we had an opportunity ahead of ourselves, and and I think we went and just took advantage of it. You know, I think we uh, capitalized on that. And so I remember that first game was a battle, um, and it, on the road. Um, <clears throat> And then we ended up splitting, went one and one. And when we came back to, to Lithuania, the the way that we walked into that gym and everyone was wearing green, um, packed house. And I don't think I don't think we had a chance to lose those games. Just the way the energy in there was built up. You know, I think um, our team that fueled our fire, and we just came out swinging on all cylinders and um, ended up winning the next two at home, and making it to the final four. And it, it was an incredible experience. I remember. Um, I think Saris was in tears. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, which, fair enough, you know, that's a big moment, especially in his, his home uh, town, home country. 
Um, and I remember everyone was just ec ecstatic because obviously, um, you know, it was something that hadn't happened. And so everyone was just thrilled. And so then we go to the final four and same thing. I don't think we felt like underdogs at all. You know, I think um, we went into that final four, like, Hey, let's, let's make our mark. You know, why, why stop now? And um, everyone in the locker room thought the same thing, which uh, when you have that, when one or two guys think it, okay, great. But when the whole entire locker room feels that way, I think um, that's when special things happen. And so, um, I, I got to I got to I got to go back real quick because you kind of yeah. downplayed you kind of downplayed games three and four. You talked about yeah. how how psyched you were, how great it was, and everything else. You guys won game three by twenty, and you won game. Well, you, I don't know how much you ended up winning game four by, but you were up by twenty five going into the fourth quarter. Okay, so that was I, the number because I didn't. I knew we we won, and you I, blew them out. I think Niffy out, but I didn't want to say by like a, a bunch. <laughs> I didn't actually know the stat. So okay, so so I was right. My my gut feeling because I remember we came in there and we were hitting everything, and it didn't even feel close. Yeah. Um, so now having those stats, then for sure, fair enough. Yeah, then. but I think that I think game three was eighty to sixty, and then the, the last game I don't remember the five, the score, but I know that you guys were up by like twenty five or twenty six going into the fourth quarter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember watching the game. I didn't know until I did my research here now that you guys were up by so much, but I can remember watching that game on Euroleague TV, and I was and I'm looking at the fans, and I'm seeing you guys up by twenty something in the fourth quarter. I'm like. There is no place on earth that I'd rather be right now than sitting in that stand, in those stands right there with the green shirt on, just, you know, because it had to be the biggest party ever. Un was, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, I guess I did downplay it. It was unbelievable. I think at the end of the third quarter, like you said, I, I didn't remember exactly, but people were celebrating in the arena already because yeah. we had that comfortable of a lead. And so the energy in there was just um, – unreal everyone was dancing jumping around celebrating every made shot with just icing on the cake you know and so and, and i'm sure Cyrus was still yelling at you if turn if you turn the ball I, over I, you know? I think he was i think he probably sat down with like two <laughs> one minute left you know the whole time um but yeah that was that was definitely special because the the energy in there was something you, you can't even really explain that's i guess what i'm having a hard time with because yeah. you just have to experience that that um, momentum we had and that that feeling in that gym at that time because um, you, you meant a lot to them. There's a difference between uh, I'm not trying to compare them, but there's a difference between the, the the European stadiums and the American stadiums. The type of cheering, the type of atmosphere that that's in the stadium. It, it's it's totally different. It's more like the the, the in the states you you're in a stadium and it's like that corporate. You know, like, oh, everybody's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, here they're singing and they're, they're, you know, they're, one person starts and then all of a sudden 15,000 people are all singing the same song. It's just yeah. crazy. It's definitely special. And, you know, in college, you got some good fans, like student section and stuff can get right. And all that kind of stuff. But but this is like the entire arena. You know, yeah. this is this is um, people's Not, childhood teams. You know, right. this is like the, they like bleed these colors. Like that's that's the way that European fans kind of kind of feel. And so, um that, that was definitely special, just also knowing what basketball means in Lithuania. You're not just playing any sport. You're playing their, you know, their country's sport. That's everything they, they um, you know, have passion for. And so um, you, you knew the significance of it in that moment, and it was, it was very special for sure. I, I've been fortunate enough to commentate um, and, and be in the last couple of Final Fours. I, I got a lot more Final Fours commentating than I did playing, let's put it that <laughs> way. <laughs> and And – one of the most special moments that I that I've shared was I got to interview Saras after the, the game that you guys won against Jessica for third place. You didn't get, unfortunately, against Fenerbahce. You guys just couldn't get it going. There was something missing there that day. Yeah. But but I, I want to jump to the positivity more than more than that. The, the first like game, it. it was just so special, man, to see you guys celebrate that victory. It was it was a beautiful thing because. Because it went deeper than your bench, it went deeper than your locker room. It went, it went to your country. It went to to the country of Lithuania, and yeah. it, you and you felt, you felt the enormity of it when you, when I was watching it. And then I had to go down and talk to you guys and and bring my mic down there and like put my arm around Sardis and talk to him. It was just, it was such a special feeling. It, it was one of my favorite feelings of all the final fours, and that's like seeing champions crowned and bringing a cup and everything. But one of the, the best feelings I had was when you guys won that third place game. What was that like for you guys? Yeah, that was definitely very special. And like you said, like there's been champions and, and um, you know, first place raising the trophy, but, you know, winning a third place game and feeling the, the energy that you felt and the support and the love that you felt for winning that game because the entire country is behind you of Lithuania, then 
it was it was special and um i remember we did that whatever the viking chant and um, right. you know in the gym and all the fans were there and um it gives you chills you know and i i don't even know if i can put words to do it justice but um you know when you're in that moment and you're doing those chants and everyone's dancing and smiling and laughing and and you just feel um that support uh, it just gives you chills in that moment and um it's something very special and surreal I mean, you have to feel like you've been, you, you, that you're part of it, that you're, you're, you're Lithuanian by blood at that point. I mean, <laughs> definitely. Even still to this day, I have Lithuanian fans always uh, on social media, you know, message me and give me support, which is, it's, the love is incredible. Get know? used, that, that, that to, get used to it, man. I'm 55 and they still love me for some reason. I never <laughs> even, and I never even played there. That was the worst part. It was just like, just cause I have a Lithuanian last name. So they love me. Yeah, for yeah it's incredible. How the fan the support that they have is, uh, it's truly special. And, and going there, I had a little idea. I knew, I knew basketball meant a lot, but going through it two years and um, experiencing it and everything, it's, um, you know, it's something that I can't even explain because uh, the support and the love is still incredible. I think everybody needs to, needs to take one year to play in a place like Countess or Victoria, you know, these, these small towns that it's all basketball, you know, because it's just, it's, it's good but it's also bad when you're not playing. When you're not playing well, you don't really want to be there. But <laughs> yeah, don't go to the mall after some bad losses. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, about Saris, real quick, how difficult is is it for a point guard to play for him? Because mm -hmm. he, I mean, he he's a demanding coach. We see the screaming, we see the yelling, we see the calmness, we see the craziness. Sometimes we see we see everything because he's so. He's so just, I mean, he's an exhibitionist, you know, he doesn't care what the camera sees. Yeah. And, but for a point guard, it has to be even more frustrating because he has to be so much more demanding of you than he is of anybody else. Yeah. I'd say he, his expectations on point guards um, is very high and he, um, cause he was a point guard, you know, and, and the strength for him was, um, and he admits this and he told me many times was, was his mind, you know, and the way he, um, you know, understood the game and the way he approached the game mentally. And so when you play for him, he expects that and some out of you and mm -hmm. um, to get on the same page as him and, and have that, that mindset. And so um, my first year, especially, it was a wake up call. You know, I was, I was there thinking, okay, I'm going to shoot my threes. I'm going to make some passes. I'm going to run up and down. Like I, I thought, you know, he could teach me how to play a pick and roll, but he taught me things I had no idea he was going to teach me, you know, just, the way to approach the game mentally and some strategy things, you know, some, some ways to just approach, um, you know, key moments, competitive moments and mm -hmm. approach games when you're playing um, teams that are bigger than you, teams that are smaller than you, everything. And so he, he has a lot on the point guard and he expects um, that the point guard gets the, the team organized. Um, the point guard's calm under pressure. The point guard, um, there's certain moments where someone else would probably make a mistake and you yell at the point guard for it, you know, right, exactly <laughs> because, because everything ends up um, coming back to the point guard, you know, if to the little else, guys, to the little guys, else, if someone else messes up the play, like it's not their fault. It's the point guards. Actually with that, there's, a, there's this three I hit in the final four. Um, and there might be a clip that people have seen before. And he, I hit a three at the end of a shot clock. And it was like, it was a three and maybe the second or third quarter, bring the game close against Fenerbahce in this, the semis. And he comes over and he's yelling at me. I've had so many people ask me like, well, why was he yelling at you? You just hit a three pointer, you know? And if you read his lips, he's saying like, how come no one knows the play? Because I didn't get the team in the offense and I probably did some other thing and hit some like difficult three point shot. Right. But he expects so much. Yeah. I made the shot, but the offense wasn't running properly. And I, I think I remember that play. It was either at the end of the third quarter, there's a timeout right after it. Yeah, there was a timeout right after it. That's why yeah. I did. He went to the bench and he was literally yelling right yeah. in my face, you know? And my, um, my, my, hey, my guys, my guys on here at IMG, they'll find it. Don't worry. They'll find it, okay, yeah, they'll they'll find it for you. That's going to be one of our clips. And it's funny too, because now at that time, I understood Saris enough. And I think I was actually laughing in that moment, you know, because – Cause I understood like, yes, he's angry. Okay. He's happy. I hit the three and he, I know why he's angry because he expects so much and he doesn't always look for the result, but because that might happen. I hit the three, maybe two out of 10 times, you know, but if the team gets in the offense or we do everyone's in sync, you know, it works um, the majority of the time or a better percentage. And so he just expects his expectations are really high. Um, and so that it challenges you. Um, it helps you grow. 
And it, it, honestly, it helps the team succeed because at the end of the day, when everyone's clicking on the same page and everyone understands what their job is and, um, you know, they do it, then um, you have a better chance of success. So, yeah, he's challenging. He's tough. But at the end of the day, it makes sense. And you understand the reason behind it. You don't always listen to the, you know, oh, he's yelling at me. Oh, he's this and that. Well, he has a reason for it, you know. And no. so um, he's not just doing it because he just wants to yell. I always say the same thing. Everybody, Selko Obradovich was, was the toughest coach I ever had. He was the most demanding coach I ever had. But he's the guy that I most respect today that, that ever coached me because he because he brought the best out in me. And, and you know, some guys that yell at you, but, but they want the best for you. So, I mean, it, it's a positive thing, not a negative thing. It's just like, yeah. it's, but it's just like those four years of college. It's hell to go through it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, and, and at the end of the day, when you win, like, he's not yelling at you anymore, you know, like he's, right. he's there celebrating the locker room with you. So, um, you know, you give and take a little bit. Yeah, you, you have the yelling, but you also have the moments where you're winning and everyone's happy. So yeah, he, he asked me a long time ago in an interview, he was like, don't ever ask any of my players of, of, of the night the night after we got into the final four. I all said, right. all right, I, I, keep, I said, I won't ask anybody. I said, I don't think they're going to tell anyone. All right, that one's done. <laughs> but, but you said that you like change. And of course, if, we're, if you want us to, if you want us to leave that comment for your wife, because you might, your, your wife might think yeah, that yeah. that's like. Yeah. Yeah. Separate that one without <laughs> relationship change. That one stays steady. That one stays steady. Okay, yeah. good. Let's get that clear. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you you're in this God status in Countess now by essentially almost winning the Euro League. For you guys, it was like a victory. Yeah. And, you, and you pick up, you go to Barcelona. I got asked why. Again. I, again, an, another change, another opportunity. I think everyone knows Barcelona, um, what that means, you know, what that brand means, let alone. But um, basketball-wise, you know, they're they're one of the, the top teams in Europe. And um, – but they were struggling a little bit. They, they were, they, they were, were, they were struggling. But again, that that didn't uh, that doesn't scare me at all. You know, when mm. teams struggling and everything, because year to year things change. You know, and so um, I thought it was a great opportunity to go to Barcelona and um, play for a big club, um, play back in the ACB. Um, you know, have a role on a team that I can help. You know, get to the levels they want to get to, and um, you know, play with. The, I saw the roster they had. They had a great group of guys, and it just wasn't clicking. Although. They were getting a little bit better. You know, they won the Copa del Rey the, the year before and stuff. Right. So, so I just thought it was a great opportunity for me. Um, another another step up and um, another challenge ahead of me that I can, you know, kind of tackle and, and try to take on and grow from. And so and that's what I did. I, I signed to your contract there and, um, you know, just wanted to continue developing. And, and at, at that point, it was uh, it was different. Like you said, the count is your – you're happy with, you know, third place and it's great. And of course everyone's happy and there's no reason to um, not be happy with that. But then in Barcelona, it's, it's let's win, you know, it's right. let's get a championship. Let's, let's get titles. Let's do that. And I thought that challenge was something that I really wanted to, to do and uh, be a part of. It's the old saying, you don't win the silver, you lost the gold, right? And one of those, exactly. <laughs> one exactly. Of those that's is... that's what, something I wanted to take on, you know, head on right. and, and go and experience that and try to try to get that team to win some titles. You won, you won a couple of titles in, in Lithuania, you won, I think four of them, a couple of leagues, a couple of uh, the, the, Spanish, the Lithuanian Cups, and you also won the Spanish Cup in, in Barcelona. But your second year there, you, you got injured. Was it? Tell me about the foot injury real quick and, and how difficult that had to be. Because from what I see, from what I've read, and from what I've researched, that was about the only time you've ever really been seriously hurt and where you yeah. couldn't play. Yeah, so it was turf toe was the injury. It was um, turf toe? Turf toe, yeah. So it's common in, uh, I guess, soccer or, or football out football, here. Football, yeah. In, in American football, it's it's common. Um, and so in practice, I was just driving the basket, and my toe just, like, popped back. Um, and, yeah, basically it's like a – how do I explain it? I, I broke something on the bottom, and you sprain the joint. So it's basically like like really badly spraining your thumb, except it's your toe. And, and you don't avoid that. No one – it's one of those things you don't realize how important your toe is until it's injured, yeah. you know, <laughs> like how much you use it. And so it was, uh, it was tricky too. Cause it's not like something where it's like a bone, you know, like, Oh, I broke my wrist. You brace it after a certain amount of time it heals right. and, and you're good to go. Um, it's a joint and it's a toe and it's something you use all the time. And, and your toe has to carry your entire body weight. Um, and so it was tricky. And I, I talked with the staff and initially we thought I'd be back sooner than I was. And I tried it, um, didn't work out, maybe set me back a little bit. And it, the road to recovery was just really tricky. And 
and it was something where I wasn't getting straight answers and, and there's no one to blame. It's just a tricky injury. And um, right. so I'd be asking this doctor and that doctor, like, Hey, like how much longer, what do I need to do? And they'd be like, do you just need time? You just need time. And I'd be like, do I need surgery? And they'd say, we're not sure, you know, like you might not, or you might. And so that was the hardest part is the unknown. It's, it was an injury that I couldn't get answers. And for, um, I took up to the gym and everyone would ask like, how are you doing? And I, I didn't know what to say. Like, I'm okay. Like I'm alive, you know, but I, I can't play, you know, well, like, was, was there, was there ever a, a time where you thought maybe people, cause our, our minds work against ourselves sometimes when we're athletes or, or just normal people, not only athletes, but was there ever a time where you thought like people were like, what is he just bullshitting me? Is it, I mean, 100%, 100%. And that, that's something that actually that I take a lot of pride in is I, I don't want to be labeled soft. I never, right. that's something that, you know, I, you know, my, my family, it's always been, you know, work hard, work hard, everything like that. So, so when, when people are questioning um, my toughness and my, my will it to kills play, you. It, it kills you. It, it kills you. And, and you can't do anything to really defend yourself other than say like, no, that's not true, you know, cause I can't go out there and play. Um, and so that was one of the toughest parts mentally. Yeah, physically my toes hurt, but mentally it was a grind. And, and I saw the opportunity in Barcelona with the team we had. Uh, so many players I wanted to play with and the group of guys. And I thought it was going to be incredible and I couldn't be out there with them. Um, it was really tough. You know, mentally more than anything, last season was the most most difficult because of, of those factors. And so um, sure enough, after I think after five months, I, I met with a doctor in the States and um, just to make sure I flew back. Actually, I flew back on my birthday. That's how much it meant to me. I was like, hey, I'm going back. I do not care. You know, I'll be in an airplane all day on my birthday. I don't care. And just to find out if I needed surgery or not. And again, he couldn't give me a straight answer, but he more gave me the odds and said, hey, it could heal on its own. It looks like it will. You see more time. And I had to trust him. And sure enough, it, it healed on its own. And do I feel a little bit now? It's still one of those things like I feel like I had an injury on it, um, yeah. but it doesn't affect me at all you know it's not something that um you know i can't play with it's just something i have to manage a little bit and other than that it's it's all good and i can play healthy and uh comfortably and feel God, I've, I've been in this game for over 40 years i guess and and i've never heard of a basketball player with turf toe that's hey, the first you, time i've ever heard it you know one of the craziest parts too i did it on my other foot in college i have no idea why really yeah so same injury on my other foot in college so i've had it both both toes are now <laughs> turf toes <laughs> yeah turf toes and so uh, i i don't know why and so it my feet are something that i have to just continuously stay on top of you know making sure that i'm massaging them roll them out strengthen them everything like that but yeah turf toe it was uh it was a battle mentally mentally more than anything it was a real battle hopefully you got the antibodies now you got the antibodies for the turf toe since you yeah. <laughs> let's hope right <laughs> Hey, you guys now, you're in, you're in St. Petersburg to finish this thing out. You guys are 16 and 10. And this is what we started our conversation with a little bit about this league and how crazy it is. You guys are a game off pace right now. You have to play Panathinaikos still. It, let's just say, hypothetically speaking, you guys beat Panathinaikos. Hopefully it'll be that easy for you guys. You're, you're in a possible four-way tie. You're sitting in sixth place. You're one game away from possibly being in second place. And you're two games away from possibly being in 10th or 11th place. <laughs> How much pressure are you feeling these days, my man? It's incredible, isn't it? Um, yeah, after after each game, it's, it's the, the drastic change in the standings is incredible. Like, you, you almost don't even want to look at it just because you know it's going to be like a complete drop or a complete rise. Um, but honestly, I, I don't know if it's, it's pressure. I think this is what this is what athletes and competitive people want. You know, this is what the fans mm -hmm. want. This is what everyone wants is – is competitive basketball and you look at it and it's uh it's thrilling you know the, the the level of basketball being played anyone can beat anyone and that happens every year but this year more than ever mm -hmm. um and so i think we just have to take it one game at a time i think it's important not to not to overthink it and, and get tense like oh no we're sliding or get too happy we're all oh, yeah we're comfortable like you can't ever get to that point because uh things change so quickly and so um I know it's the cliche answer, but we really do just have to take it one game at a time. Like that, that's all we can really do. We don't, we don't, um, we don't like that answer on the cross. Yeah, I know you don't like that answer, but that, that honestly is true. And, and it is. It is. If you really, you really have to just focus on your next game because if you let one drop that you shouldn't let drop or anything like that, then things can change so quickly. So you just have to be so dialed in and focused on the moment. Um, 
and that's all you can really do. T- tell me how this little girl Olivia changed your life. Oh, incre- incredible. Um, <laughs> you know, the one blessing. Well, uh, obviously, we're talking about your daughter. Yeah, yeah, my daughter, my daughter. <laughs> um, no, it, it was unbelievable. She, uh, she's grown so fast, and, and she was born in Barcelona. I actually got injured two weeks before uh, she was born. So the one blessing was that I got to see, you know, her birth mm-hmm. and, and be, spend a lot of time with her and everything. So she she did help, you know, cushion that blow a little bit um, with the season and how it was going and not being able to play. Um, but it's unbelievable. Your pr- perspective changes when you become a parent. Um, and I always heard people say that. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, cool. A yeah, good story, you know. But um, when you become a parent, it's incredible. Like little things that – might have bothered you before they don't really bother you anymore you know you see like the the world is a oh big oh, oh wait, wait 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 till they get older yeah i know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's just enjoy it this true, right now exactly. right exactly exactly it's true though it's very true yeah and so honestly you come back after i tell this all the time like you come after after a bad game or or a bad loss or something and, and like they don't know any different kids just don't know any different you know they see you and they smile the same way and it completely just changes change your perspective and uh you know you get to forget things real quickly because um when you're the aspect of your life with basketball when you come home like you're not a basketball player anymore you're dad you know right. so um it's pretty special and I'm, I'm loving it i'm enjoying it a lot that that's the good part of it the hard part is is it's not custom made your our lifestyle your lifestyle now is not custom made for being a parent you're you're mm-hmm. constantly in the court your concept to be better and it's 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 varying on on your wife and I always, I always like to bring the wife into, into the subject because you, most players aren't where they are today if it, you know and have a couple of kids at home if it's not for a wife that understands exactly what, what is being asked of them and, and and I mean was your wife prepared for the travel for the for for everything that goes with having a baby with having a kid with a basketball player's life being a, a, a basketball wife so to speak yeah, I appreciate you teeing that up because I probably don't give my wife enough credit publicly as I should. That's what I. That's what I. Yeah, mean yeah, yeah, no, I really appreciate that because I really should. Because honestly, she does she does everything to keep it uh, keep it all together. Um, I was lucky; she played uh, soccer in college, uh, mm-hmm. so she understands you know the athlete lifestyle and the amount of time it takes to perfect your craft and how much from, goes from Gonzaga also from Gonzaga. Yeah. Oh, so you guys have been together forever. Yeah, so we've known each other for a long time, and so. So she understands that. So she did know what she was getting into for the most part. Um, it, it does get tricky over here, especially being from North America. Um, my wife's American. And so that gets tricky because you don't have family here to help you right. out all the time. You can't just, you know, go next door and give, you know, your daughter to grandparents or grandma, exactly. grandparents like that, you know, so it gets tricky once in a while, but um, no, she's been a rock through this whole thing um, from the pregnancy over here. She, um, manages our schedule she she cooks healthy food when i need it sleeping when i on game day she, she covers our everything so mm-hmm. so it is true that that without you know my wife and, and what she does for myself and our family it's it would be so so difficult to to get all this stuff done and perform on the level that we do and um just enjoy the lifestyle at the end of the day you know because um there's so much that goes into whether we're on the road trips and this lifestyle you're right it's not easy for for parenting and, and everything like this because we could be on the road for a long time and um you know come back at we come back sometimes at seven in the morning you know so then we right. gotta sleep and get our recovery and everything so um she's been unbelievable and i'm very fortunate very lucky to have her one of my last questions was, you got any other hobbies like traveling or anything like that but that's all done in here since you got a little kid now between basketball <laughs> and a kid those things the hobbies are done for a little bit hobbies are done it's to stay at home <laughs> feed sleep eat yeah, all that <laughs> All right, my man, let's get this over with now. We got two parts, our two final parts. One is a personality test, which I think they've already given you a little bit of a heads up on. And then the other is a EuroLeague trivia uh, test that nobody likes to do, but you have to do it. Yeah. And believe me, it's not as bad as you think it's going to be. But, okay. All right, first, let's go through the personality one. You got a free round trip ticket to go anywhere in the world. What's your destination? I would probably say New Zealand. New Zealand, nice. Yeah. I've never been there. Never been there. Been to Australia, but there's 
the, the outdoors, you know, the, the weather, the mountains, everything. Something about New Zealand just attracts me and stuff. And and also, it's probably one of the furthest flights. So if I'm going to get a free round trip, I got to take advantage of that. Because yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, you, know? you could sleep the whole way, too. You could sleep the whole way. So you got to take advantage of that opportunity. So I can't go next door if I have that opportunity. True, that's so true. You got to go as far as you can. Last movie or series that you watched? I uh, watched Inception the other day on the road trip. Inception? Yeah, the one with Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. yeah, I watched it again. I watched it a couple of times, but I like those like thinkers, those movies that make you think. Right. Yeah. Sit down at a table, you can order anything you want in the world, any meal. What's your go-to meal? I mean, I, mean, I wanted to ask this question as if you were like on death row, <laughs> <laughs> but they, you really wouldn't let me ask it that way. Hey, so. hey and, you, know, you know what's tricky with me? I like everything. So I would they say, give me, give me one of everything, but I would probably have to go with either Mexican or sushi, those two. Right. I had some Mexican One last two. night. I, I yeah, was, Mexican. Uh, I love some good Mexican. Yeah, plus you, plus you get to down the margarita with it. Yeah, yeah, why not? Childhood Idol. I'd be lying if I didn't say Steve Nash, obviously. Um, you know, Steve Nash. And the other one probably was a, a hockey player, Matt Sundin on the, the Maple Leafs. Yeah. You know, I watched Matt Sundin a lot. I'm a huge NHL fan. I played for about four or five years myself. I played hockey when it wasn't politically, or not politically, or it just wasn't healthy to play hockey because yeah. I was 6'6". Six, six. Yeah. And when I was on skates, I was like almost seven foot. And doctors were like, you need to get off those skates. You're going to ruin your knees. Hey, I was about to say, believe it or not, when I played hockey, I was like the tall one out there. Right. So that, that's how you know it's it's not a sport for tall guys. Yeah, but then you got guys coming around like Ray Bork and, and, and all these other guys that are six, 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 seven playing. I'm like, damn it, I would love that game. Yeah. Bobby Orr was one of my idols growing up. Okay. <laughs> um, one game that you can go back and replay in your life that you would love to go back and go play again? I'd probably say my Elite Eight game against Duke in March Madness. That one for sure was uh, was one I'd like to play again. Yeah, you, you came prepared for this, man. Yeah, that, like one, that one's an easy one for me, though. That one's, that one sticks out. It's your last game in college, like we talked I about. Before, so that I one know, sticks hard. out for sure. Top three EuroLeague memories. This one's tough for me. I, uh, I'd i say Final Four with Algiers. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say the playoffs, those, this is kind of combined, but the playoffs in really? uh, in Lithuania against uh, Olympiakos. Um, and I don't know the last one. So many games. How do you pick? I know, it's hard. Those ones stick out. I'd probably say another one was when we beat Cheska in the in the Zagiris. Um, those were special games, you know, at home. I don't know if they beat Cheska for a long time. Um, fans were rocking. So that one, and that was my first year there. So it was the first year of the probably big win that we had. I'd say that one. Perfect. Sounds good. Um, when this is all over, what are you gonna do? When when you gotta hang up those shoes? When? Yeah. I mean, uh, any plans? I don't know. I really don't know. I I want to do something with sports, basketball mm -hmm. probably. I just I just love staying attached to the game. I love the development of it, um, pro sports and everything. I do like the aspect of business. Maybe getting some sort of like business angle. I really don't know. I, I kind of want to keep my options open, but I, I do like stuff like that. You know, I love the, the training aspect, especially of basketball, um, you know, weight room on the court drills and skills, like the personal development side. I love that stuff. So maybe get into some personal development, um, basketball training, something like that. Start planning it out, man. It's, yeah. Take hey, it, it from a, like this, right? That's take, why. Take it from an old man. Before you know it, you'll be yeah. like, damn, I should have planned this a couple years I, ago. No, Everybody I, told I, me to. I say like, oh, I got lots of time. Left. I don't want to think about that yet. No, you don't. It's going to be, dang, <laughs> last season. So. All right, that was the easy part. Uh, and plus, on top of it, you were prepared. Now for the hard part. We got five questions. Each one of them is worth 10, well, 10 points, then 20 points, 30 points, 40 points, yeah. 50 points. All right? Let's see how I do. All right. Who is the most veteran player of Zalgiris Kaunas? Paulus Kunis. Bam, 10 points, look at you. He's the mayor out there. The guy's been there for <laughs> two decades. <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna be like Simonis. He'll be another petition to become president. Yeah. Um, the Who's the all-time rebound leader of the yearly competition? 1,914 rebounds and 300 and 67 games. It's between two guys, but I think it's Paul Stankunas as well, isn't it? 
Damn, you got it. Yeah, 30 he, he points. Passed, he just passed Reyes, I think, didn't he? Right, exactly. Okay, that's why. I thought it was going to be a trick question there. That's why, okay. Uh, well, it was a trick question because it was yeah. the same answer twice in a row. Yeah, exactly. I just, that's why I was like, man. I, they usually get me these questions right before we go on air, so I'm, I'm reading them with you. Um, all right, number three. How many seasons has Zenit St. Petersburg played in the EuroLeague, including uh, the last one? Two. Bam, my man's got 60 points. I think you're the first guy to get all three of them, three out of the three. Number four, for how long has Pablo Lasso been the coach of Real Madrid? I'm just gonna have to throw a number out there. Let's go with, I don't know, like 13 years? Ah, you got that one wrong, 10 years. I thought for sure, for some, some made me feel like you were gonna say 10. No, I, I was going double digits, though. I knew it was double digits. I just yeah, it's it 10, 10 seasons. This is his 10th season this year. Okay. So what, what are we at? We're at uh, 30, 50. We got 60 points. This one's worth 50. This is worth 110. Oh, you ready? <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to read this one to you, to be honest oh, with gee, you. I'm nervous now. What is the capacity of the Mediolanum Forum of AX Armani Exchange Milan? Oh, exactly. the arena. Oh yep. God. I can't believe I'm I can't believe they're making me ask you this one, but <laughs> might as well just it's a pretty it's a pretty round number, so you might get lucky. Okay, okay so that, that might help me though. Let's go with uh let's go with eleven thousand. Oh, you missed by fifteen hundred. Twelve thousand five hundred. Not bad. That's not bad. It was a it was a good call. <laughs> For some reason, I thought you were going to get number four and number five right. <laughs> hey, my man, look at it. This has been a pleasure. I never got actually got to know you, got to sit down and talk to you. And unfortunately, we have to do it by Zoom, but it's been my pleasure to, to have you on the show. I want to thank you, obviously, for taking the time out and, and spending this hour and some change with us. And, and nothing but the best of luck to you guys. I know it's going to be a tough eight games coming up, man. So It's going to be tough. It, Tell your wife to, you know, take that baby, get a little bit more rest if you can, and and, and make sure that, that that you're ready to play every game because that's going to be a great end of this season. Yeah, it's going to be good. I'm looking forward to it. But, yeah, thanks for having me. This has been fun. And, uh, yeah, we'll cross paths soon. Perfect, Kevin. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye.